So welcome everyone to today's lecture as part of the Sustainability Council lecture series. I'm Elise Forche and I use she her pronouns and I work at the Sustainability Council at the University of Alberta. Today we will hear from Dr. John Robinson. I would like to start today's lecture with a treaty acknowledgement. The University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we are located in Amiskatiwa Skagen, which is situated on Treaty 6 territory. This land is the ancestral space of the Papas Chase Cree and Métis Nation and the traditional territory of the Nitsitapi Blackfoot, Nihia Cree, Dene, Stony Nakoda, Anishinaabe, and many other Indigenous peoples whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. As a settler, I continue to reflect on what it means to live, work, and play on Treaty 6 territory, and I'm committed to growing my knowledge and understanding of these important histories and how I can honor the gifts of these lands. The Sustainability Council works with all faculties at our university to spark learning, discovery, and citizenship for sustainability. We offer courses and experiential learning opportunities for students, support sustainability-related research, put on sustainability awareness events, and engage with the broader community on sustainability initiatives. The lecture series is a bi-weekly event which highlights sustainability research, teaching, and innovation over a range of topics with the goal of generating conversation on sustainability across disciplines. We are hosting a diverse group of speakers from both the University of Alberta and beyond to cover a number of topical issues related to sustainability and sustainable development. To find out more about the Sustainability Council's events and opportunities, please feel free to browse our website and sign up for our newsletter. Riley's going to include the link to that below in the chat, and he's also going to include the link to the lecture series so you can see upcoming events. Now on to Dr. John Robinson. John is a professor at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy and the School of the Environment at the University of Toronto. He is also an adjunct professor at Copenhagen Business School. At the U of T, he is Presidential Advisor on Environment, Climate Change, and Sustainability. Dr. Robinson's research focuses on the intersection of climate change mitigation, adaptation and sustainability, citizen engagement to explore sustainable futures, sustainable buildings and urban design, the role of the university in, in contributing to sustainability, creating partnerships for sustainability with non-academic partners, the history and philosophy of sustainability, and generally the intersection of sustainability, social and technological change, behaviors and practices, and community engagement processes. We will hold a Q&A session after Dr. Robinson's presentation, so please put your questions in the chat. And now we will welcome Dr. Robinson. Thank you, Elise. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I hope everyone can see my slides and hear my voice, uh, and I will proceed. So I want to talk about this idea of uh, normalizing sustainability. And I'd like to begin with um, a question. Uh, sorry. Um, why haven't we achieved a sustainable world? There's been decades of work, tons of activism, lots of policy, and yet we're not there. Um, why not? The usual reasons, I think, have to do with the power of vested interests or arguing against or actively preventing sustainability from happening resistance to change uh, in the culture at large, uh, and uh, lack of knowledge or ignorance about the true state of affairs. While all of these things uh, may indeed obtain uh, in different ways, I want to propose three somewhat different reasons and possible responses, having to do with first, the nature of the required changes themselves. Second, the importance of development pathways, and I'll explain what I mean by that when we get there. And then, uh, and most substantially, uh, an argument about normalizing sustainability. The net effect of paying attention to these uh, three reasons, uh, three, these three areas of research and activism, um, uh, and adopting approaches based on them would be to shift the locus of agency somewhat away from a primary focus on individual conscious decision making, which is indeed uh, the, uh, where a lot of government policy and, uh, and activism, and indeed research takes place. And so starting with the question of change, um, I want to just highlight a very common way of thinking about change and the kind of change that we need. I'm gonna use as an example, the UN's emissions gap report uh, from 2022. There's one published every year um, and 
that report does what a lot, a ton of literature and, and government documents do, which is show uh, this gap that needs to be closed. Uh, the chart towards the right of, of the screen is, is a little complex, but basically what matters uh, for our purposes here is there is a sort of a baseline projection, uh, in this case called unconditional NDC uh, scenario, which is what we expect will happen if we don't do anything more. And then there are lines a little lower down, which is where we want to be. In this case, uh, if we want to achieve no more than a two degree average global uh, increase in temperature or uh, a little lower down a 1.5 degree uh, temperature increase. So that's the gap, the gap between where we expect we're gonna be if we don't do all the good things we're supposed to do and then the, uh, the where we do actually want to be. I think, uh, and you can find this in ecological footprint analyses and energy analyses, all over the place, there's this gap between what is likely to happen without further action and, and where we wanna be. The agenda in all of this work is clear. We need to close the gap, right? We need to bring that top line down to the desired bottom line. In this case, when we're talking about uh, carbon emissions, we need to change our energy system so as to uh, eliminate that gap. The important point I wanna make here is that all of these studies um, uh, take uh, as given essentially the baseline scenario, where we expect to be. That usually gets much less attention than the uh, analysis of how to get down to where we want to be. But uh, so that the baseline is, is, is kind of uh, the, uh, the, the point that tells us how big the gap will be. Uh, and so how much we have to do in order to achieve the goals we want. So the, the baseline is crucial uh, in all of these analyses, even though it does get less attention uh, and indeed analytical attention in most of these analyses. The problem with that is the baseline is changing. Um, and we can see this in a bunch of different ways. We can look at the literature, pretty extensive literature on, on sort of mega trends. And what we see, this is PricewaterhouseCoopers version of the mega trends that are affecting us all. Um, what we see are these five mega trends about urbanization, climate change and resource scarcity, sh geopolitical shifts, demographic and social changes and technological breakthroughs. All of these things are happening as we speak. They're all leading to uh, significant change, uh, they're all rather hard to predict. Another example is some work by Policy Horizons Canada, a great uh, agency in the federal government that does foresight and future studies kinds of work, many really good reports on this. This comes from one of them back in 2018, where they're really looking at what they call a system map of emerging global challenges. Um, and we don't have time to walk through all of the different uh, global challenges uh, that are represented here. So I direct your attention to the legend. We have a couple of global challenges that have to do with culture, some to do with society, technology, economy, governance, environment. And these are all, as the arrows suggest, dynamically interconnected. They all affect uh, at least one and, and most cases, multiple other such changes. So what we have is a very complex system of shifting baselines, of changes that are occurring uh, that in, in alone, the individual changes are pretty hard to predict, but how they're gonna interact with all the other ones is, uh, is yet harder. Another example, again, from Policy Horizons Canada, we have nine forces of change uh, outside the hexagons, um, and I won't walk through those all, um, uh, but simply to say that they are expected to affect these life course components, the six hexagons you see there. So again, what we see is this really complex interplay of factors uh, that are changing the ground uh, on which we stand in ways that are very hard to predict. If we move down uh, a level of, of granularity and just look at the industrial sector alone, we see similar kinds of things going on. This is kind of a fractal phenomenon. These kinds of uh, massive system changes are happening at multiple levels. Uh, so 
uh, additive manufacturing, the cloud, cybersecurity, IoT, horizontal and vertical system integration, and so on. These are all transforming the way production processes work around the planet. And let me just say that uh, the argument here is not that all these changes are moving us in a more sustainable direction, quite the contrary. Many of them are, uh, are not. So with regard to question number one, the nature of change, uh, the conclusions I'd like to suggest are that there is no single baseline. This is indeed a key lesson of scenario analysis uh, as brought uh, to prominence in the early 1970s, um, uh, the, the recognition that there are indeed multiple baselines. There's many different ways that the world could unfold. Um, and uh, it, it's rather risky to tie ourselves to a, a single baseline. Transformational changes in key aspects of our world are already occurring. And what that suggests then from a sustainability agenda point of view is that it's the agenda is not so much to create change as to steer all of these changes in more sustainable directions, because many of them actually are taking us in the wrong direction from a sustainability or a climate change point of view. So the issue isn't creation de novo of new change. It's somehow reigning herd on all these changes and trying to tilt them in more sustainable directions. Uh, uh, one whole sub-literature on this that I think is really fruitful to look at is uh, the literature on leverage points. Where are the leverage points that will help tilt these changes that are going on all around us in more sustainable directions? Um, this, I think, is a very different agenda than the agenda of creating changes if we're kind of locked into stasis. Um, and uh, somehow we have to get out of that and create all these new changes. Um, there is, of course, uh, technological lock-in effects and so on uh, that need to be, but that they are also a matter of trying to find the leverage points to unlock those, uh, those lock-in effects. Okay, moving on from change to the question of pathways. Uh, now that we think there may be multiple baselines, uh, what does that tell us? And how, how do we think about uh, the pathways between here and there. And here I, I've put up on the screen a, a chart that is uh, very prominent right now in the climate change field. These are the new scenarios, socioeconomic scenarios that have been developed uh, for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, to replace the previous ones which were created in 1999 and 2000. Um, and uh, what these uh, scenarios show, and that there's a dark line that reflects the kind of uh, uh, median or mean or average uh, position, and then the uh, colored uh, around that is the range for that particular uh, scenario. And what we see here is if our baseline uh, CO2 emissions, global emissions, were just under 40 gigatons in the in the in the base year of the analysis. Um, uh, which now is a few years back from, from today, uh, these scenarios suggest that global CO2 emissions could be three times higher than today by 2100 or less than today, lower than today by 2100. Now, the key to note here is the underlined word in the, in the title of this graph, um, which is uh, baseline. These are indeed baseline scenarios. What does that mean in, in IPCC speak? That means that none of these scenarios have any climate policy in them, except that climate policy that was already the case in the base year. Um, so no new climate policy in any of these scenarios, and yet emissions could be three times higher than today or less than today. What's going on? How can that be? Well, What's going on are these multiple baselines uh, called shared socioeconomic pathways or SSPs. And an SSP is a combination of coherent assumptions about how the world might unfold, how things in the world, uh, activities and patterns of development and so on might unfold in a kind of coherent way. So we see SSP one, uh, it, it gives rise to uh, 
without any new climate policy gives rise to emissions lower than today, whereas SSP5 in, in, uh, implies massive increase in CO2 emissions. So what are these SSPs? Well, one way to get a, a really simple sense of them is uh, to look at the names they were given, uh, and you can see those to the right. The names that were uh, that have a little bullet in front of them have actually been removed because they were deemed to be too controversial. So I stole this from an earlier document. Um, uh, but you can see even from the names that are still around, the, the main name at the top of, of each, um, that they, they depict very different assumptions about how the world will unfold. And uh, the sustainability world is a world in which uh, emissions decline because of a whole bunch of decisions and actions and policies that are taken, not for climate change reasons, but for other sustainability related reasons. Uh, and that gives us the low emission future. So what is this graph telling us? It's telling us, I think, something really important. To reach our climate goals, the choice of pathway is more important than the choice of climate policy. Think of the amount of climate policy you would need to get from that top yellow button in 2100, the SSP5, um, down to uh, the level we want emissions to be. Uh, it would be exorbitant and ruinous and incredibly difficult to do that. Uh, whereas if we're in SSP1, we're actually uh, oh, a big part of the way to where we want to be. Uh, uh, so being on the right development path is the crucial decision. And I want to repeat that line because I, in my experience, not very many people have heard this message from all of the reading they've done on climate change issues. To reach our climate goals, the choice of pathway is more important than the choice of climate policy. What world are we creating? And then we will add climate policy to that. So what do we mean by pathway then, if that's the case? Here's how we defined it in the fourth assessment report of the IPCC back in 2007. A development path is the complex array of technological, economic, social, institutional, cultural, and biophysical characteristics that determines the interactions between human and natural systems, including consumption and production patterns over time at a particular scale. So, pretty abstract definition, but it gives you a sense of the array of issues that are involved in determining what is uh, a development path and how it unfolds. It's not just about carbon emissions. It's not just about energy. It's about a whole suite, the whole suite of other factors, uh, including, for example, social justice and equity considerations uh, that determine how the world develops in, into the future. In some subsequent work, we went a little uh, farther down the path of, uh, of, of, of trying to articulate what a development path might mean. We said it operates at the scale of socio-technical systems and systems of governance. So it's not so much at the level of individual behavior, policy, or technology, but kind of a level up at the systems level, systems of governance, socio-technical systems. It's an emergent property of a system of a system. What that means is there's no lever, lever uh, titled development path and you pull the lever and change your development path. It isn't a decision uh, uh, that can be made at that level of the development path itself. It's emergent from all of the decisions that are made in all the systems that give rise uh, to the overall um, state of the world. So it's emergent from all of those uh, individual and smaller decisions. Um, and behaviors and actions. It exhibits interlinking regime rules and behaviors. In other words, there is inertia in these systems. There is uh, technological lock-in. There are cascading effects. So we see unanticipated consequences across uh, scales and levels. And it's reinforced at multiple levels that it not, 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 nothing can be done at only one level because of the dynamic interconnections between the different levels. So given all that, and I'm sorry, it's pretty abstract, uh, uh, what needs to change? What does all this suggest uh, needs to change? I think it's not simply technologies or policies or behaviors, 
but constellations of actors, socio-technical systems, governance approaches, and culture. These are all part of the mix, and they all have a role to play in the, the uh, emergent development path that, that occurs. Second, social learning experimentation are crucial drivers as are pressures from external systems. We don't know all the answers. We know where we wanna be in, in a lot of these arenas. Uh, we know where global carbon emissions need to go, et cetera. We have a lot of knowledge about that, but we don't know the details of what needs to happen in order to achieve those goals. We need a lot of experimentation. That's why it's good that the that center of gravity for climate action has moved from the national level, there's only about 180 countries, down to er the urban level. There's thousands of cities. And we need a lot of experimentation, a lot of social learning uh, on how to achieve these uh, larger targets, especially given uh, the fact that they are, the, the, the pathway itself is, is emergent from a whole bunch of uh, system behavior. Uh, and third, since the process is complex, these are complex systems, uh, which give rise to emergent properties, we need multi-stakeholder engagement. This isn't just about someone sitting in a room and making energy policy decisions. This is, these are decisions about what kind of neighborhoods we live in, uh, what the equity and social justice dimensions are of them, what kinds of technologies are employed and made available, uh, economic factors, social factors, cultural factors, and so on. In turn, this suggests the need to think about embedding sustainability um, uh, throughout the systems that already exist. Uh, what you could call institutionalization of sustainability. The big barriers to sustainability, in my experience, aren't technical. We have tons of technical uh, uh, solutions or opportunities. They're not economic, although they look economic at first blush, but if you peel back the onion a few layers, uh, they turn out to have to do with uh, the rules that could govern what people do on Monday morning, the job descriptions, the performance evaluation criteria, the codes of practice, the professional standards. These are all rules that are embedded in our institutions. And that those rules determine more or less what happens, what the outcomes are, uh, institutionally speaking. So if we don't get into the guts of the institutions and start changing these rule systems, these job descriptions and so on, um, we're unlikely to see different kinds of outcomes than we have been seeing in the past. So we want to institutionalize sustainability. We want to create spaces for innovation that allow experimentation, I think, especially at the neighborhood and community scale. Um, say in the city of Toronto, it's very different if you're talking about Rosedale or Mount Dennis. These are entirely different kinds of neighborhoods with different opportunities, uh, different uh, access to the corridors of power, and so on and so forth. We need a lot of ex local experimentation. And alignment is important. When I moved to uh, Toronto in 2016, uh, it was a moment when the federal uh, and provincial and municipal governments were in alignment on a lot of sustainability issues. Then there was an election and one of those levels of government fell out of alignment uh, with the other two, makes it much harder. So you wanna look for those windows of opportunity when you have alignment at different jurisdictions. So my conclusion on this second part of the talk, uh, pathways, is uh, that what pathway are we are on is more important than what climate policies we choose, that development paths may be a useful way to approach the question of steering pathway change. Uh, and a key question in doing so is how to embed sustainability in institutional rule systems. Now, let me turn to the third uh, topic um, uh, that I want to discuss today, and that's this question of normalizing sustainability. And I want to begin by uh, acknowledging that there's a lot of different models of behavior change out there uh, in, the, in the literature and psychology, social psychology, uh, and beyond. Tons of different models. So there isn't a single uh, consensus about how to proceed. However, very many of these models are based on uh, a, a theory of decision-making, sometimes called the rational choice approach. And the rational choice approach, uh, which you've seen many times, I'm sure, is about identifying your problem or your opportunity, uh, articulating some alternatives, uh, evaluating them and choosing the best one, implementing it, seeing if it gets you where you wanna go. If not, you go back to step one and so on. 
So this is all about managing information in order to uh, create good policy. And these rational choice models lead to an approach to behavior change, which I call persuasive communication. Persuasive communication is the view that we, the experts, know the story. We know the, the real story. We know what's going on. And the goal is to replace our audience's incorrect story because they don't clearly understand the nature of the problem or how serious it is, or the consequences of inaction and so on. So we want to replace their incorrect or incomplete story with our correct story. That's the purpose of the communication. The focus is on conscious individual behavior change. That's what we're trying to change, people's individual, say, consumption behavior. The premise is people are resistant to change, but can be convinced if they're given the right information. And the model of behavior change there then is something uh, that's been called the information deficit model. The information deficit model goes something like this, that we want to get to behavior change at the end. So we provide uh, better or more information that leads to change beliefs and attitudes as people learn more, they become literate in energy or climate change, uh, that those beliefs and attitudes then give rise to a, a new intentions to, 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 to change behavior, and, and those intentions are realized in behavior change. The problem with this uh, nice uh, uh, unidirectional flow is that the opposite direction also applies, um, that we often bring our intentions in line with our actual behaviors through processes of rationalization and uh, our beliefs in line with our intentions. And even we interpret information through the lens of our beliefs and attitudes. So uh, this kind of flow from information to behavior change is not only disrupted, it's actually uh, works in reverse uh, to some degree. And there are Many, there's huge literature is going back about 40 years on, the, uh, on this failure of the simple linear flow from information to behavior change. I've listed a couple of the fields on the screen here. Uh, for example, 40 years of energy efficiency program evaluation, uh, billions of dollars spent on why energy efficiency programs work or don't work, uh, and, uh, and, and on to the other areas as well. So there's a problem with this information deficit model. And I'm going to give you some examples just uh, to drive the point home. Here's a study that Kahan and colleagues did back in uh, uh, 11 years ago. Um, and they talk about the SCT prediction. Sorry, I'm going to get rid of some things on the screen that are preventing me reading my own slides. Um, SCT is the science comprehension thesis. So the ST SCT prediction based on an information deficit model says that as the chart shows that as your science literacy or numeracy goes from left to right, from low to high, the perceived risk of climate change goes up. So the more you know, the more concerned you are because that information has affected your beliefs. That was the prediction. This is what they found that there wasn't much effect at all. And if there, if there was any effect, it was in the opposite direction, that higher literacy and numeracy actually reduced uh, the perceived risk. So what's going on here? They say members of the public with the highest degrees of science literacy and technical reasoning capacity were not the most concerned about climate change. Rather, they were the ones among whom cultural polarization was greatest. So you don't see polarization on that chart, but that's a crucial part of their conclusion. So let's turn to another study. No nice charts here, but some text, the concluding text. Overall, our, this is a study uh, done in 2017 by Drummond and Fishoff. Overall, our results suggest that education, whether measured in terms of general educational attainment, um, science educational attainment or science literacy scores may increase rather than decrease polarization on limits on issues linked to political or religious identity. So we're getting a little closer to a, a reason here, issues linked to political or religious identity. Here's another study also from 2017. Uh, and what you see on these charts on the right is uh, uh, the education level along the horizontal axis 
for environmental support, the, the box to the left, and belief in climate change, the box to the right. So as you move to the right, education level goes up. And uh, then the vertical axis is showing you the probability of supporting the environment on the left-hand box or belief in climate change. Um, and the colors indicate political affiliation, either liberal, moderate, or conservative. And what you see is that among liberals, the more educated they are, the more concerned they are. And the more they believe in climate change, the more support for environmental issues. But among conservatives, that's not the case. It's the opposite. Uh, the more educated you are, uh, the less belief in climate change and the low, the less uh, support for environmental issues. Moderates are more attuned to liberals in this case. So um, what we see then is that information is not unambiguous in terms of its effect. Among partisans, increased levels of education led to diverging environmental support with liberals increasing their environmental support and conservatives decreasing their environmental support. Higher levels of education led to increased attention to an awareness of elite political cues, which was associated with the greater adherence among partisans to partisan consensus positions. So the more education you have, the more attuned you are to the cues from your side of the ideological spectrum. Um, without changing the messaging from political elites, they go on to say, simply communicating more about scientific findings will have little effect on partisans, particularly as their education levels increase. I think this is failure of a paradigm, but actually before I go there, I just wanna point out that this information deficit model although it has been pretty comprehensively debunked in the literature, it still guides almost all government communication uh, and indeed a lot of activist uh, communication uh, programs as well about science literacy, climate literacy, energy literacy. How many talks do you think there are going on around the world right now on uh, the science of climate change, public uh, talks? Uh, there's just this massive attempt to educate people on the view that that will indeed lead to behavior change. Um, I think this is a failed paradigm, and I want to quote a former, a, a good colleague of mine, um, who said that the best evidence that the information deficit model doesn't work, in other words, the best evidence that information doesn't change behavior, is that we have 40 years of evidence that it doesn't work, but we still keep using it. So we are evidence, our, our programs are evidence of the, themselves of the failure of the information deficit model because they ignore all the information about the utility of such programs. So that's a bit of a problem, but I think there's a deeper problem. Even if persuasive communication worked, even if we were able to change people's behavior through education, it may be ineffective in achieving our goals. Research shows that individual choices make only a small difference with respect to overall sustainability impact. Uh, just to give you some studies on this, uh, here's one from 2012. What you see on the chart on the right is green consumers and uh, who care about environment, brown consumers who don't, and then average who are the white dots. And what you see is income, household income plotted against footprint. Do you see a pattern of green and brown, a difference between green and brown? I don't think so. Uh, there is no pattern there. The study found no statistically significant differences between the overall ecological footprints of green consumers and brown consumers. Pro-environmental behavior was coupled with only a small reduction in ecological footprint in specific areas. What's going on? Well, this study tells us a little bit about that. These are browns, beginners, energy savers, and super greens. And again, we don't see the greens doing better. This is now a uh, uh, um, carbon footprint, um, but we can see it isn't dropping as you become more concerned about the environment. No significant difference is found between the impacts of environmentally aware and environmentally unaware consumers. Both brown and super green consumers consume approximately the same amount of energy and produce approximately the same amount of carbon emissions because the motivation driven activities of super greens are offset by structural factors. So what's going on? What are these structural factors? This study tells us a little bit about that. Rather than using less energy, 
People high in environmental self-identity in our sample use slightly more energy and have a slightly bigger carbon footprint than those indicating less environmental awareness. Why? Because both environmental impact and environmental self-identity increase steadily with rising income. In other words, the income effect swamps the behavioral effect. At any given income level, indeed, a green consumer uses less energy as a lower footprint than a brown. But the slope is so steep between low income and high income in terms of uh, ecological footprint uh, that the low, the greens and the high end of that scale use way more energy than the, bra than the uh, browns uh, down at the lower levels of income. So income swamps uh, individual behavior. Another study suggests it is the highly individualized nature of private sphere pro-environmental behavior that may be its greatest flaw. By suggesting that citizens can meaningfully contribute to environmental reform in the absence of collective political action or more informed choices about where to live in relation to amenities, private sphere pro-environmental behavior work risks obfuscating meaningful solutions to environmental issues. This, by the way, is not at all an argument that we shouldn't try and behave in an environmentally and, and sustainable, uh, environmentally responsible and sustainable fashion in terms of our individual uh, choices and, and consumption behaviors. Ab absolutely, we should. It's a good thing to do. It's just, it's not going to take us where we want to go uh, if we don't deal, address the larger structural issues and collective uh, action issues. This to me, suggests moving away from persuasive communication to what you might call emergent dialogue. Emergent dialogue says, we don't know the story. Uh, the experts don't have all the answers. We need to collectively co-create it in process of collaborative uh, meaning creation. The focus uh, shifts from individual behavior to cultural change and change in social practices and institutional rules. The premise is change is omnipresent, it's everywhere. And this takes us to a social, not an information deficit model, but a social practice model. What do we mean by social practice? Here's one influential version of it. Um, uh, it comes from Elizabeth Chauvin colleagues in the UK. Uh, a social practice is a form of collective behavior that emerges from the interaction of three dimensions. The material dimension of objects, tools, and infrastructure, meanings, cultural conventions, expectations, socially shared meanings, and competencies, knowledge and embodied skills. What does that mean? Here's an example from a, a particular social practice, which is bicycling. Uh, I like this quote at the top because uh, it's what was said in an article about biking in Copenhagen. It's just what we do. It's not some kind of changed action that we do because of uh, we've learned about uh, the importance of, uh, uh, of reducing automobile traffic. It just becomes part of the normal behavior of life. So there's a skills and know-how uh, component to this, understanding how things work, how to use the bike lanes, traffic signals, etc. There's a materials thing. You need bike paths. You need good bikes. You need the, the appropriate clothing, changing facilities. And there's meanings associated with all this. Um, having fun. Uh, there indeed can be environmental motivations and so on. And then uh, as a result of the interaction among these threes, we get things like different choices of clothing, meetings among cyclists, change business hours, repair clubs, bike pools, and so on. And what builds up is a whole suite of practices about biking. In Copenhagen, uh, for example, almost half of all commuter traffic is by bike. That wasn't true in the 60s in Copenhagen. It was a car city. So it's not that it's inevitable that, you know, Scandinavia does this and we don't. Uh, they did things that led to changes that resulted in uh, massive collective uh, changed activities. So what we see here is a, a, a spectrum between individual conscious chosen behavior, the realm of psychology and economics, and collective unconscious practices that are carried, that we carry, which is more in the uh, uh, sociology and anthropology realm. All right, I want to just give you a couple of examples because uh, this is somewhat abstract uh, argument. Here's a building we built uh, at uh, UBC, opened its doors in 2011. And I had a PhD student who did a study of the 
people in the building asking two questions. Does the building play a role in the development of uh, the engagement of the people in the building and in, in the development of social practices related to sustainability? And can a building be net positive in terms of inhabitant well-being, health, and productivity? Can a building make people healthier, happier, and more productive? She discovered, we won't go into all of what she discovered, but she did discover a bunch of new practices. I won't go through the list here, but they're substantial and nobody suggested these be done. They emerged organically. They emerged from uh, the experience of being in the building. She also noticed a, a number of new normals that people reported uh, through the interviews. Her conclusions were that SIRS did indeed enable a transition from passive occupants to active inhabitants in the context of this net positive sustainability narrative around the building. The building is perceived to be net positive in human factors, health, productivity, happiness. Normalizing sustainability through practices in a well-promoted interactive net positive building means combining and reframing meanings, objects, and skills, the three components I mentioned before of uh, social practice theory. And this building did accomplish this reframing. Uh, I'll just mention quickly that we also found very different recycling behavior in this building with no additional signs than were found elsewhere in campus. We had a significant change in recycling behavior and it wasn't based on differences in attitudes, values, beliefs. It was based on being aware of being in a highly sustainable building. Think of the implications for building design and urban design if the way we build our cities and buildings has big behavioral consequences without any particular uh, explicit attempt to accomplish those goals. Uh, the paper that was done by a, a psychology professor and his students it said people are significantly more likely to correctly choose the proper disposal bin in a building designed with sustainability in mind compared to a building that was not, excuse me. I'll just give you a couple of pictures of the, this is the atrium of the SERS building. It's a wood uh, uh, structure building. Here's the classroom, which is daylit. Uh, and uh, here's the only signage. So it's not like there are all these signs around telling people to develop new normals or have new behaviors. Uh, there was just this sense of it being a highly sustainable environment, or there is that sense still. So the conclusions on this third part of my talk as long as sustainability is the default, as, sorry, as long as unsustainability is the default, if that's the norm and we need to change behavior, we're failing. If sustainability is the change, we're failing. Um, uh, we need to move from individual behaviors to look at these collective practices. Uh, the goal is to make sustainability the default practice, not the change, the automatic practice, not the change. So in summary, with regard to change, I think we need to steer change, not create it uh, at the level of underlying development pathways, not just policies and technologies and individual behaviors in order to normalize sustainability, make it the default, not the change. Thanks very much. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, John, for that really interesting presentation. Um, we're gonna open up the floor to questions now. If you could put the questions in the chat, I will uh, read them aloud for John. And um, we'll just start with one question that I thought of during this presentation. I was just thinking about the study that found that with more education and information on on sustainability that the liberals and conservatives had different results of like concern. And I was just wondering, is this based on, I wonder if this difference could be attributed to the sources of information they're getting, or if this was compared at similar places where they're getting the information, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, that, that wasn't distinguished. And that's an important point because of course, we all know about the bubble effect uh, that you, you, you have a certain set of sources you typically go to. But most of these studies are looking at the, the same information being interpreted differently. If you want a, a possible um, explanation for part of this, um, 
why would more education make you more skeptical about climate change? I think it's actually a very simple answer. Um, the more education you have about climate change, the more able you are to make arguments in support of your predetermined position that you had going into getting that information. So if you're already skeptical, more education makes you able to make more sophisticated arguments to support your skepticism. It doesn't change the skepticism. If you're already inclined to believe that climate change is uh, you know, an emergency, uh, existential threat, then uh, the information will also, uh, the more educated you are, the better you're able to make that argument. So I don't think it's very surprising that information actually feeds into and supports uh, existing uh, or, or sorry, uh, education feeds into and supports existing uh, prior views. Thank you for that. Um, Kieran doesn't have, it looks like not quite a question, but they said Dunning-Kruger effect in action. I'm wondering if they're asking for an example of that. Does that? Sorry, Dunning-Kruger? Is that in yeah. the chat? Oh. Oh, yeah, I, I'm just I, seeing that now, but it's it doesn't seem to me yeah. like a question. I, I'm a, I'm a, interpreting it, so I may have it all wrong, but I think they're saying there is an effect called the Dunning-Kruger effect that uh, that uh, would uh, support this kind of finding. But we'll have to ask Kieran uh, if that's what he means. Gotcha. Okay, so um, I'm just going to move on to Tammy. So. They said, thank you so much for this lecture. What do you think about sustainable buildings that serve as social infrastructure, buildings like public libraries and rec centers? How can we make sustainability the default? Yeah, this is the key issue. We built a building, that CERS building I showed you, opened its doors in 2011. It was designed to be net positive in four environmental ways, energy, operational carbon, structural carbon, and water quality, and three human ways. That's the ones I talked about in my lecture health, productivity, and happiness. We achieved five of those seven. So we got two of the environmental and all of the human ones. And the interviews with the inhabitants in the building, and we like the term inhabitant instead of occupant, because we think occupants are kind of passive recipients of the building systems. Inhabitants have a sense of place in and engagement with the building. We think that we got incredibly positive comments from the inhabitants of that building. So I think if we build buildings that are designed to be net positive, that are designed not just in environmental terms, but in human terms, people will respond to that and they will like being in those buildings. Um, and uh, that, 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 that in itself induces uh, a greater willingness to act sustainably as well, because you're in an environment that kind of expects that. It doesn't have to be overt. There's no signs telling you how to behave. Um, but you just absorb that. So I think your examples of public libraries and rec centers are crucial. These are places that many people go to, uh, to spend time. Uh, imagine if you, every time you go into a building like that, you just feel better. It's the air quality is really high. There's lots of natural light. There's lots of wood. It's just a very attractive and pleasant place to be. And uh, it operates in a highly environmentally sustainable way as well. And that, you know, there maybe there's some signage about that somewhere. Um, that I think could be hugely influential um, if we routinely did that. Why are we building buildings? Uh, my big question is, why is anybody building a building that isn't intended to be net positive in both human and environmental terms? We've done it, we know how to do it. Why are they not happening? Now there's a whole bunch of answers to that question. But I think it's a good question we should continuously ask. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a great point. Um, I'm going to move on to Brian's question now. They said your talk example at the end suggested that changing the objects and technologies in the social environment changed the culture, the technological determinism and design works. Why an emphasis on pathways and policies? Yeah, the the in my mind, unless we change the institutional rules of the game that govern what everybody does in their institution, and by the way, this speaks a bit to the private sector question as well, um, then people are gonna continue doing the same things in their work life that they have been doing in the past. Um, 
And uh, we're, we're just not gonna get there by a bunch of individual consumption uh, improvements. So we have to change the structures of the systems themselves. So policy is crucial, I think. Um, institutional design is crucial. Um, uh, it, it, it need, it's not that we don't want individual change, behavior change or value change or anything like that. It's that we want to complement that by uh, looking at the systems level. So you could think of a hierarchy. At the bottom of the hierarchy is policy, technology, and behavior, and we want to change all those things. Next level up is socio-technical systems and systems of governance. So this is the realm of transition theory. Uh, next level up is culture and values um, and worldviews and so on. I think we need to operate at all those levels simultaneously. We need individuals to support policy change for sure. Social mobilization is critical, um, but we also need those institution and institutional and collective changes. Thank I hope you. that answered the question. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on to Lucas's question. They said, thanks, Dr. Robinson. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on what normalizing sustainability would look like in a business context where growth is demanded. Yeah, there, I don't know a politician on the planet who doesn't support continued economic growth. Um, and so that's an, a, a big issue. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm a, I like the arguments of degrowth and so on, but it's just not, uh, it's not an option in the existing uh, business and not just business, but political world as well. So I think we need to think about the, the issue of uh, how incremental change can lead to more radical change. I don't think we're going to jump immediately to zero growth, although I love the work of my friend Peter Victor, who's written a lot about a no growth society and how that can work. Um, but I think we need to have this kind of intermediate stage of uh, looking at how growth can be directed to more equitable, socially just, and environmentally sustainable uh, outcomes. So um, I think. You know, this is the ever-present problem of who's co-opting whom. Uh, are you being co-opted if you do that in, in the service of continued endless uh, material expansion? Uh, or is it work the other way around? I hope it, it can work the other way around because I think that's the way we have to proceed. Um, although I do, I, I, I'm a big fan of, 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 of groups that want to take a more radical position. I think that position needs to be out there, needs to be pushed and pressed and, and made articulate. Um, uh, but I also think it's important to work within the organizations that we have and try and tilt them in more sustainable directions. So I think it's a matter of temperament. You know, Some people are so angry at the way things are and so disgusted with business as usual uh, that they really wanna work for radical solutions immediately. And lots of people think we have to because of the, the timeframes involved. Others are saying, no, I think we can actually turn, you know, the turning radius of the University of Toronto is long, but it's not infinite. Maybe we can re recreate the university in fundamental ways uh, by working within the system. So I think you pick your place on the spectrum there. Uh, and I would just plead that people are tolerant of people that have a different view on those issues, that we're all trying to get to the same goal, I think, uh, a much more sustainable world, we want massive change. It's just there's different tactics and approaches to getting it. So in the business environment, I think there's a lot to be done. The whole ESG world, for example, uh, people don't understand. ESG doesn't tell you anything much about environmental or social impact. It's about risk management. So it, you know, it's a very different thing than it looks like from the outside. Nevertheless, it can be part of the process of change. And I do believe changes uh, uh, can can cascade uh, and things that were unthinkable 10 years ago become the norm uh, more quickly than people realize. So I'm a bit of an optimist about our ability to retool um, these things. So in, in a business, in a private sector environment, find those leverage points moving us more in more sustainable directions, find the arguments, the ways in uh, and really uh, push for those. That's uh, my best thought on the matter, I'm afraid. Thank you. So next uh, we have Kala 
So they said, really interesting, it seems more like a phenomenological approach that focuses on process, feelings, and experience than over-rationalized behavior, which can result in cognitive dissonance and then denial, as explored by Carrie Norgard. I was wondering if you could revisit what you were saying about spiritual slash philosophical slash religious roles in this approach to steering change. Yeah, well, this, uh, this is a, an issue close to my heart because I do a bit of work on, on this, the question of um, ontological multiplicity, to give an ugly term for it. Uh, I think that ultimately sustainability takes us beyond those three levels I talked about to, a, to an even deeper or, or more fundamental question about the nature of the world we live in. And I think, for example, speaking as, completely as an outsider to Indigenous knowledge, it seems to me that it challenges us at that fairly deep level um, uh, of what is real, what is the world made up of. Uh, and so I think, I think that's another whole arena in which uh, it's really worth uh, a, a lot of work uh, to try and uncover different ways of being in the world than are typical in our highly industrialized modern society. So I would add that maybe as a fourth arena um, uh, where work, uh, I think, needs to be done. Uh, I think you're right about it being more phenomenological, um, that th it, this is, in the end, about how people experience the world. Um, and uh, we can over-rationalize this stuff. We can turn it into you know, uh, a much more cut and dried uh, set of measures of, of, uh, of, of excuse me, of indicators uh, that have te technical and technological solutions. I, I don't think that will get us where we wanna go. I think we do need to reach out into the way people experience the world. What we all want, I think, is a better world. I think there's a pretty widespread sense that things are not the way they should be. And so we're not just changing our technologies and our policies and, and even our buildings. We're actually potentially changing our way of being in the world. Um, and I think maybe we're in that process. Maybe the last hundred years and the next hundred years are part of a fundamental transformation at a fairly deep level. That's kind of my hope anyway. Thank you. Um, okay, so Paula's question, could you share your views on the current Canadian federal government's approach to sustainability? Do you see initiatives embodying more of a pathway approach or a climate policy approach? I think what's happened in Canada as in many other countries is the, the whole climate change issue and indeed sustainability has become enmired in partisan debate so that it becomes, it's the politics of the thing that drives a, a lot of government behavior rather than the substance of, of, of the issue. So what plays, what will play in different constituencies? How about interprovincial and, and federal provincial relations? If you, if you watch how the media covers these issues, like most issues, they cover it as a political debate. Right? Uh, it, does this going to help? Is this climate change uh, policy going to help the liberals get reelected? Is it going to play into the hands of the conservatives? Where's the NDP and all this? They 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 continuously politicize the thing, and I I'm afraid that is a, a major driver of policy, not just in Canada. Um, so I, I I think it'd be nice to get away a little bit from that, but it's very hard because uh, partisanship is at an all-time high. It's probably as high as it was 120 years ago in North America, um, and so uh, you know that's the kind of world we're in. Um, and I would that's not to say there's not lots of good civil servants really trying hard to do substantive change, um, but I actually pin more hope on uh, the the urban scale these thousands of cities who are trying out different things. I think a lot of the energy of the system is there now and a lot of uh, new ideas are emerging from there. So in a sense, the, the province and the feds in Canada uh, might be more, a little more followers than leaders on some of this stuff. Um, which is not to say, I mean, I think I'm, I'm a fan of what the feds are trying to do in climate change and a lot of the ideas they have. Um, I think are good ideas, uh, but it, it, to me, it's a little too mired in partisan politics uh, to, to be uh, as effective or as fruitful as, as it could be perhaps. Thank you. 
So we're nearing the end of our of our time here, and I just want to say thank you everyone for your questions. And I see that there are more questions. And since we are out of time now, I wanted to see John if you have a spot where people can find you if they wanted to ask you these questions after this presentation. Where can they look to find you and your work? Um, well, I'm happy to uh, put my email address in the chat. Uh, I'll do that right now, and I'm I'm happy to get uh, email about that. That's my usual way <coughs> sorry of communication um so that would be my suggestion um sorry i can't multitask very well type in and speak at the same time but there it is so anybody is certainly welcome to drop me a line and i will respond perfect and i'm actually just going to put our the sustainability council's youtube channel here so that people can come see the recording once it's been edited and posted it could be a couple of weeks but just look there for this recording in the next couple of weeks and you should find it there and yeah i see that john put his email in there so if anyone wants to grab that before we end our call that would be great and i just wanted to ask john if you want to stay on a couple minutes after just to have a quick debrief but other than that thank you everyone so much for coming and i think that concludes our presentation today